Let's review our main result from last time. We have G, polynomial with coefficients in some field F. Suppose degree of G is equal to N. And we choose K, a splitting field of G over F. With that, we can define the Galois group of K over F to be the set of automorphisms of K fixing F pointwise. We saw this as a group, and we noted because these automorphisms fix F pointwise, they fix the coefficients of our polynomial. And from that, we have that any of these automorphisms must permute the roots of G. To reinterpret, we have a group action of the Galois group on the set of roots of G. This action is faithful, so we can identify the Galois group with a subgroup of S of n, the symmetric group on n letters. Now note n is going to be the degree of G, so that's going to give us an upper bound for the order of the Galois group, okay, less than or equal to n factorial. In this part, we want to do better than that. So we'll have upper bound given by the degree of k over f. We also saw if g was irreducible over f, then the action of the Galois group was also transitive. And we were able to get applications from that. Now, where is everything heading? So our ultimate goal is the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. Statement of the theorem is going to take place inside of splitting field of some polynomial. We have a correspondence between subgroups of the Galois group and subfields of the splitting field extending F. So what we need for the theorem is, okay, the way we go from subgroups of the Galois group to subfields and back. So we start by just looking at automorphisms and subgroups of automorphisms. Now, if I have F any field, I just consider the field automorphisms of F. So that's gonna be a group. Now we know if the characteristic of F is equal to zero, okay, one is gonna generate a copy of the rationals. Any automorphism will fix those rationals pointwise. Likewise, if we have characteristic of F positive, so suppose P a prime, then one is gonna generate a copy of Z mod P, and again, any automorphism will fix that Z mod P pointwise. Okay, and then we note for a given automorphism, okay, the set of elements fixed by that automorphism may be bigger than our rationals or our Z mod P. There's a definite connection between automorphisms and subfields just by considering elements that are fixed. Now, let's look at subgroups. So if I have K any extension of F, not necessarily a splitting field, I consider aught of K over F. So this is gonna be the set of automorphisms of K that fix F pointwise. This is gonna be a group. Okay, in fact, it's gonna be a subgroup of all automorphisms of K. Okay, we know why this is useful. For one, we know that this is gonna be helpful in studying polynomials with coefficients in F. And we know it's gonna play a major part in the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. Let's check our inequality with some examples. First, we have the automorphisms of the rationals of joint square to two, fixing the rationals. This is isomorphic to a Z mod two with elements, identity automorphism, and the automorphism carrying square to two to minus square to two. Here, K is just gonna be the splitting field of X squared minus two over the rationals. So expect a transitive action of the group on the set of roots, K okay, plus minus square to two, and we see that immediately. For the inequality, we note the order of the group is equal to the degree of k over f, both being equal to two. Next example, we have automorphisms of the rationals to join q over to two, fixing the rationals. As we've seen before, the only element in here is the identity. So the order of the group is one, the degree of k over f is three, and we have strict inequality. Finally, consider the automorphisms of the rationals adjoined four through to two, fixing the rationals. Okay, again, we have isomorphic to Z mod two with elements, identity, and automorphism carrying four through to two to minus four through to two. Here, the order of the group is two. Degree of K over F is four, and again, I have strict inequality. 
So something to note here, in these cases with strict inequality, we're not working with splitting fields. We note the other ingredient, although we won't say much about it in this part. If I have H subgroup of either aught K or aught K over F, I want to consider K sub H equal to, we take all elements of K, such that okay, these elements are going to be fixed by every automorphism in H. I'll leave it to you to show. K sub H is always a subfield of K. We call this the fixed subfield of H and K. And if we're in the case of aught K over F, F will always be contained in K sub H. Now, one last thing to think about for our inequality, okay, when I have a splitting field note, give K splitting field G over F. We saw earlier, okay, we recall, the order of the Galois group of K over F is less than or equal to N factorial, where N is degree of G. And we've seen earlier, if I take the degree of K over F, okay, with K splitting field for G, it's less than or equal to N factorial. Okay, now we got this. What do we do? I start with F, our base field. Then I just want to take the roots of G of X over F in K. Okay, I pick one, I adjoin. It gives an extension of degree N. Now the worst case scenario is, is I adjoin each root I'm only splitting off a single factor, which is just going to drop the degree of the next extension by one. And then when we multiply these numbers to get the degree of k over f, we get an n factorial. So we know these numbers okay, seem to be aligned very well, and that suggests that there's a connection between these two. It turns out it holds in general. As a first step to our inequality, we have the following proposition. We choose any number of distinct automorphisms of K, fixing F. Let's call those phi's. We'll consider linear combinations of the phi's with coefficients in K. Now, these linear combinations in general are not going to be automorphisms. They'll just be maps from K back to itself. And if we assume that we have a linear combination equal to zero, we must have that all the coefficients are zero themselves. Now, this feels a lot like a result about linear independence of the phi's. Only catch is we don't have a vector space over k, only a vector space over f. So if we interpret things in terms of vector spaces over f, what can we get? Well, first note, these automorphisms, okay, we have automorphisms k fixing f, by the automorphism properties, okay, and the f fixing property, that means these automorphisms can be thought of as linear transformations from K back to itself, linear over F. We also have that the phi's are invertible because they're automorphisms. So we're really looking at invertible linear transformations. Now, that would mean we consider our phi's, okay, the proposition says they'll be linearly independent over F as elements of okay, the Hom space from K back to itself over F. Okay, this is just a fancy way of saying vector space of linear transformations from K to itself, linear over F. Now, for the dimension of this space, if we choose a base for K over F, then we'll just have N by N matrices with entries in F. So, dimension of this space is just going to be the degree of K over F quantity squared, and that'll give us a bound for the number of automorphisms that we can have. Okay, and then you'll note, this isn't quite what we want. Okay, the result we want is not going to have the square on it. But we're not getting our result directly from this. Okay, because note, we're not assuming the C's are in F. We're actually assuming they can be in all of K. So there's going to be a follow-up theorem for this proposition. Now, for the proof, first step. Our automorphism group has only one element, we're done. So let's assume it has more than one element. We're going to pretend our linear combination is given as a relation, as so, as small as possible. So we'll want that all the C's are non-zero. Now, if we have only one element that we're using here in the sum, only one phi sub i, well, C1 phi sub i equal to zero means that 
the C1 must be equal to zero, and that's our result. So now we assume that our linear combination has at least two terms, okay, and all the C's are non-zero. Because phi1 and phi n are distinct automorphisms, okay, there's gonna be some element in K such that phi1 of alpha is not equal to phi sub n at alpha. For my next step, what do we do? Well, we're gonna take our relation here and we're gonna put into it alpha beta, where beta can be any element of K. Okay, and alpha we've just chosen here. Now by the automorphism property, okay, we could split the alpha beta parts out as so, and that must be equal to zero. I'm also gonna take our relation with beta in it, and I'm gonna multiply by phi sub one alpha. That's also equal to zero. And if we take the difference here, okay, when we do our bookkeeping, this first term's gonna to go to zero. What's left over, okay, well, what are we gonna have? I'll have coefficients C2, phi two alpha minus phi one alpha together. That's gonna be the element of K over here. And then we're gonna have phi two betas being set out aside as the automorphism part. So that's gonna give us an expression with n minus one terms, meaning we have here that this isn't as small as possible. I've just dropped it by one. So that's a contradiction, and that gives our result over here. For a concrete example, we'll let k be the rationals of joint square to two, we'll let f be the rationals, and if we want a basis of k over the rationals, we can use one square to two. With respect to any basis, the identity automorphism will be the two by two identity matrix. And for the non-trivial automorphism, okay, with respect to this basis, we have one, zero, zero, minus one. So here, we're just setting square root of two to minus square root of two. We see immediately that these matrices are linearly independent over the rationals. And I'll leave it to you to work out linear independence over K. To finish, we have our main theorem for this part. So if the degree of k over f is finite, then aught of k over f is a finite group such that the order of the group is less than or equal to the degree of k over f. Now, for the proof, okay, we're assuming that degree of k over f is finite. So I can find a basis for k over f given by alpha one through alpha n. We'll choose automorphisms of k fixing f Okay, let's suppose we have phi one through phi sub n plus one. I'm gonna set up a system of linear equations over k. So I'll have n equations, and n plus one unknowns, the coefficients x are gonna be in k. So what do we do? We're gonna apply each phi to each basis element. So these are gonna give us elements in k. We're just gonna line up these equations as so. Now, because we have n equations, n plus one unknowns, we're gonna have a non-trivial solution. Okay, so non-trivial meaning all of the coefficients are not equal to zero. Now, if I call that solution, okay, C1 through Cn plus one, we put them into our equations, and that's gonna give me, okay, we'll have n equations as so, and we know because these are basis elements, okay, and everything's linear, we just use linear combinations to replace these basis elements with any element in K, which we're calling beta here. Now that's gonna be a problem, okay? We could pull off the beta here to get a linear combination, okay, coefficients in K, as we had in the proposition. So that's gonna mean, using the proposition, that all the C's must be equal to zero, but that's gonna contradict having a non-trivial solution. So that means we've proven our proof by contradiction. Now, the next step in the inequality, we wanna ask what happens when we have actual equality, and that'll be related to splitting fields.